Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed the first two episodes of this wild harvest series that we're doing with Shane Mahoney. Shane, six years ago, started accumulating all this data related to wild harvest. And many of us take for granted food security. In this, we're gonna talk about food insecurity because there's a lot of cultures that rely on wild harvest. There's many of us who rely on wild harvest to some degree. And maybe we don't feel food insecurity, but that is definitely an issue as it relates to the wild harvest and the resources that give us that. There's also the, the health benefits, whether it's your physical health, your mental health, there's a lot of benefits of wild harvest. And in this series, we talk about all of them. We're now going into episode three of seven. In this chapter, we're gonna get into all of those benefits of wild harvest. Thanks for watching. Well, Shane, we're talking about the Wild Harvest Initiative, wild harvest of all sorts, all types. Um, for me, if you asked me where my food came from, I bet you it'd be a much different answer than somebody who maybe lives in Atlanta yep. or Washington, D.C., or maybe somebody who lives in Kotzebue, Alaska. Yep. For me, you know, if you asked me where my food came from, it would have a large amount of wild harvest. It had in, in the last week, I'm thinking about, okay, uh, there were some antelope, there were some moose, there were some walleyes, uh, a farmer's market. Uh, I, but not everybody has access and has the cultural background I do where wild harvest has been a part of them. So across this bigger picture of the U.S. and Canada, where does most food come from? Well, there's no question the vast majority of the food that provided to citizens in our two countries come from industrialized processes, whether that's industrialized ocean fishing and, and the related industries of aquaculture um, and from large-scale uh, animal farming or industrial livestock raising, mm -hmm. primarily of, of cattle and pigs and chickens that are the three uh, you know, mainstay uh, products that come out of that, but there's lots of others, you know, ducks and geese and, and, and yep. so forth. Um, and then, of course, there is the whole fruit and vegetable um, portion of that, and that is also, of course, pretty much, if you look at it statistically, you know, the heavy dependence is on the industri industrial production of that in places like the Central Valley and so on and so forth. I, I think the estimate is that something like all of your fruits and vegetables, 40% uh, of them for the entire nation actually comes from that one region of your country. Yeah. Um, and all of those things, of course, are, um, they're all, um, they, they have proven to be wonderfully effective and we have, we've obviously learned how to scale up industrial agriculture in a lot of ways. Um, and they, those ways have been required to meet the growth in human populations and to ensure that we can feed people. Mm -hmm. But of course, the other thing about many of those processes is that they are, number one, they can be uh, highly vulnerable when they're highly localized, you know, as production yep. units, as we saw during COVID, when things go wrong in a meat packing plant or something of this <laughs> nature. Um, and the second thing about them is that although the trajectory has been one towards of late uh, a kind of more enlightened view of how the environment should be dealt with. Uh, there have been a lot of negative environmental effects from those industrialized processes in the past. Mm -hmm. And the third uh, component, I guess, that we might wish for improvement on is that, uh, and we are seeing improvement in this, is you know how the animals in particular are treated uh, in those large scale circumstances and some species, as I've said earlier, it's easier to sort of give them a more natural life than it is for others, and that's just the reality of the thing. Even, however, when you look at the off products of these processes, or the build up products, let's say for industrialized agriculture, just this sheer amount of things like manure, for example, that are generated at some of these big facilities is really <laughs> quite extraordinary. Yeah. You know, these manure ponds, as they're talked about, are really quite something to behold from a distance. <laughs> um, but uh, On a winter day, not uh, yeah, on a summer day. Exactly. Uh, and uh, you have that kind of thing, of course, but you also have, um, you know, in the case of non-animal industrialized production, you have to remember that to, to feed people fruits and vegetables on the scale that we rely on it now, very large amounts of land have to be taken. Right. 
And at one time, uh, it was very common to think about this in a in the dichotomous ways that human beings love to think about such things. Oh, well, if it's good agricultural land, then it must should should definitely be turned over to agriculture, you know. Mm -hmm. And if it's not good agricultural land, then it might be turned over to something else. Well, the truth of the matter is, on a lot of really good agricultural land today, uh, where we, you know, raise crops like um, from rapeseed to corn or wh whatever it might be, those were also, as we know, very high, highly productive wildlife areas, were they not? Yeah. And so it wasn't a matter of trading off uh, land that, you know, wasn't that good for wildlife and we could use it for agriculture. The truth of the matter is a lot of the very best land that was available to wildlife was taken for agriculture because the soil was there. Yep. The nutrients were there. We, we, we could produce things uh, there. And so... Even when you know we think about things like our food that comes to us that's non-meat or non-dairy that you know comes comes to us such as fruits and vegetables, it's not as though there is no environmental cost. <laughs> yeah. and, and to wildlife, um, if we were to create a world that was totally dependent on on fruits and vegetables, as some would argue, you know the scale of wildlife habitat that would have to be taken that would damage that would lead to losses of wildlife would be absolutely colossal right. we have 8 billion people to feed it's a lot of bananas right <laughs> so i mean uh, you know a there lot has of water, to be a lot of chemicals and that's the other side of things now we have to talk about the drawdowns that have to come from the natural world to to feed that massive amount of growing plants, which essentially, you know, almost all plants except for desert and high alpine or high, re high altitude adapted species, you know, are simply sponges for water. They love water. They can't get enough water. Right. I mean, and so uh, that drains an enormous amount of water. And of course, those waters that are drained from whether it's the Colorado or any other river in a, in a system in any country, that amount of water being drawn down for our purposes variously, you know, uh, you know, has effect on the aquatic life that lives in those places. Yeah. Regardless of what new baselines we establish, nobody can doubt that you can't draw a third of the water out of a river and have exactly the same river that you used <laughs> to always have. Yeah. And then you do mention the, the chemicals and the, um, the antibiotics, uh, the pesticides, you know, uh, uh, the various things that we add into the system that is made necessary, particularly if you have a large number of animals living in close proximity. Um, we know that these will inevitably be recipes for disease. challenges with disease and so forth. And to maintain the health of these animals, we've long learned that you have to provide them with certain kinds of products to help boost immune systems and so on. Again, you know, through government regulations and various choices of personal practice, uh, we are getting somewhat better. Uh, in all of this, but uh, the truth of the matter is that many of those food pr production systems, not all of them, but many of them, certainly if you look at it globally, industrialized agriculture and industrialized fisheries are amongst the most heavily subsidized industries in the world. Uh, and a, a great deal of them simply could not su survive except for the massive government subsidies that are, right. that are, that are placed there. Um, you know, world fisheries are just unbelievably subsidized. I mean, it's, it's, it's really extraordinary to think about how much money is simply really? paid to global fisheries just to fish. Wow. And this is also true with agriculture. And of course, um, part of that is the, the cultural problem of how can you possibly stop these industries because they're highly valuable to us. Yep. And these are not pejorative comments. They're simply realities. One of the big things we are working on right now internationally is how to reduce or eliminate these what we call perverse incentives uh, to large-scale industries of food production. Uh, we know we need the big-scale industries, but the idea cannot be to simply pour behind the scenes, you know, 30 to 40 percent of their value, of their output value, into those systems in the beginning and onwardly through provision from public funds. Yeah. And that is happening at a scale that most people in the United really? States and elsewhere in the world are simply not aware of. I'm, I've, I've raised yep. my hand. I'm, yeah. but just, I'm not aware of Anyone who wishes so. to, just Google you know, how much subsidies, uh, how much are world fisheries subsidized, yeah. and they will be absolutely astounded. Yeah. Yep. Well, that answers the question that Randy Newberg is not the good example of how the majority of the planet gets their food. No, but he might be the very best example of, of how a larger percentage of the human community ought to be getting their food. <laughs> okay. Um, 
One of the things we hear about often, and I'll be honest, I, I've never really felt this myself, so I don't, I don't really have the ability to put myself in the shoes when I see it on a newscast or I watch a video on it, and that is food insecurity. I feel the, the blessing of, of living in the wealthiest country in the world. The, the, it, the, instantly, my likelihood is less. Mm -hmm. Living in an abundant place where landscapes allow me for nothing more than a fishing and hunting license mm -hmm. to go and get some superb, high-quality food, mm -hmm. protein, at a very low cost. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think about food insecurity, but that's because I have a lot of privilege and benefit of not having to yeah. think about it. Yeah. The rest of the world has to think about that. Yeah, I mean, um, if you got good shoes, you don't worry about small pebbles on the road. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's just the way it is. But you know, if you have holes in the soles of your shoes, you you sure as hell do. Yeah, and um, the statistics are pretty frightening. I mean, you know, we can we can obviously find a scale of statistics in terms of food insecurity, going all the way from what a global picture looks like to what a regional picture looks like, and the various continents outside of Antarctica, you know, where people are living. But food insecurity is a reality for billions of people yeah. at some level. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean when we talk about food insecurity that, or food security that, you know, it, it's, it's the difference between, you know, having three meals a day and getting all your vitamins and so on and then to something where people, you know, have to forage in the gutters. There's a lot of, lot of ways right. food insecurity manifests itself. The basic statistics, overall statistics, suggest that in Canada and the United States, it's, it's uh, in, in the United States, one in 10 uh, families face some level of food insecurity. Wow. And in Canada, it's one in eight. And I don't know if you followed uh, fairly recently, but some of the statistics that have been you know, discussed very much in the public media in, in your country here in the United States about the number of veteran families yeah who are facing food insecurity. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is a little hard for anyone to fathom right. uh, right. in a very rich country. It's not a criticism in the sense that I have no right to criticize the United States in this regard, but I can say the same thing is happening in Canada and I feel quite uh, at home saying that shouldn't happen in Canada and yeah. it shouldn't happen anywhere, right. really. But it goes to point out that even people who have done something absolutely extraordinary, which is true of every person who has served, um, you know, they can find themselves in these kinds of circumstances. One in six children, it is estimated, in Canada and the United States, this is where the statistics come together and are basically the same, you know, at some point in time faces, uh, you know, have less food than they ought to have for proper health and growth and so forth. Yeah. So it actually is a, a significant reality for even our wealthy countries with all of our capacity. And of course, part of that comes from we're very wasteful and we waste a lot of food, of course, you know, right. so you have all of those kinds of things going on. And of course, this gets broken down very differently between uh, ethnic and uh, groups and, and, and social classes, as we've talked about on other aspects of this show. Um, those statistics, if you, if you brought them to bear on, on particular groups of people right. in the United States, in particular <clears throat> cultures, particular backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, particular immigrant uh, uh, groups, and so on and so forth, who have more recently come to this country, et cetera, or for African Americans, for example, or perhaps for indigenous peoples, you, know, you would find that those statistics were much worse in many right. cases. So these are very much kind of average statistics, but it's pretty frightening to think about when you see the lifestyles that we live, mm -hmm. and that never seems to be something we have to worry about. But right. obviously for a lot of families and for a lot of children, um, this, is a, this, is a, this is just a, a reality and it's a terrible reality at the same time. Now the question obviously is, you know, how far can something like this idea of harvesting from the wild right. contribute to that? Exactly. Well, That's... I mean, it, 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 it matters. Uh, the answer will, will be determined in large part about, you know, how we see our conservation systems moving. If the, uh, if the harvest of wild foods can in fact be uh, either increased or more in some ways more equitably shared, 
then of course the harvest of wild foods can make a difference at some level. Wild foods that come into most homes uh, recreate, in my mind, a, a kind of different food-based economy in that home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go all the way from a home where everybody buys everything that they consume in that home at a grocery store versus some people who have a mixture of a lot of grocery store and some wild foods to people who have a lot of wild foods and some grocery store. Yep. And there's a continuum there. I believe, as I said, that if we were to turn the scientific knowledge we now have about issues of soil conservation, of uh, fitting the best species for the landscapes, in other words, returning to more of the native species, grasses and so on and so forth that we had, mm -hmm. if we did things of managing landscapes, particularly forested landscapes, as the Native Americans did, creating much more kind of almost Serengeti-ish landscapes, you know, quite open and dispersed with a lot of sunlight to the floor and a lot of production on those landscapes. I'm absolutely convinced that we can grow a, a tremendous amount of wild food on the land that we currently are not doing. Mm. You take something like rabbits, you know, snowshoe hare and moose. Uh, on the island of Newfoundland, we, we, we didn't have either moose or snowshoe hare. They never made it there after the ice oh, receded really? 6,000 years ago. The, mice, uh, the ice <laughs> on that island was a, a mile high during the peak of the glaciation. And after it uh, melted and eventually ran out to sea, of course, it took pretty much all the soil with it. That's where the Grand Banks, the great fishing banks were created. It dumped oh, it all no, out I there. And that's, that. and that's okay. what's created those shallow shelves out there that you know have, have been feasted upon by nations for the last five to 600 years from Europe and everywhere else around the world to fish the famous banks off Newfoundland. But certain species didn't make it, and two of the species that didn't make it were moose and snowshoe hare. Now, in the late, uh, in the 1870s, and then again in 1903, and at about the same time, a moose were introduced on two occasions. And they were introduced, get this, seeing we're doing the show on wild harvest, uh -huh. they were introduced absolutely as a source of food for the settlers of Newfoundland. That was yeah. totally, there was no other motivation. It wasn't to give them recreation. It wasn't anything that mm -hmm. it was to provide fresh meat in a place where we could not raise cattle and do things at large scale that way. And uh, we, um, we don't know if the first introduction worked, but the second one uh, did. And at most, our entire moose population originated from about four to six animals. And uh, we have harvested well over a million of those big animals ever since. And we still have 100 or 120,000 moose um. roaming on our island. <laughs> and when it comes to snowshoe hare, they were also introduced. They never made it. They never hopped their way across the 11 miles of water that separates Newfoundland from the closest mainland. And they were introduced by magistrates who um, had positions up the coasts, in the isolated coast where I lived as a boy. And uh, this was another way of producing a very prolific uh, yeah. species that could provide a, a, a lot of food. In some years, we harvested one million snowshoe hares in a single year. And we only had 350 to 400,000 people. So right. when you start thinking about the amount of food that those two species provided to people, particularly in rural communities in Newfoundland, yeah. it was the backbone of their fresh meat provisions. Yeah. And, um, and it was done purpose, purposefully a hundred years ago and more by far-sighted people who said, we can actually harvest from the wild yeah. to, to, to literally supply people with their, with their food economy. Mm -hmm. Now, the beautiful thing about moose and rabbits is they're weed species. That's essentially what they are. Yeah. What you they want grow. is fire, younger generation components of your forests with diversity of hard and soft woods, and you can, have, you can have enormous populations of moose and enormous populations of snowshoe hare. Yeah. That may not work everybody where because the landscapes are different, but we could grow them in Newfoundland. We could easily grow <laughs> populations of these species in Newfoundland because we have the landscapes for them. So I think that the, um, you know, the, the food insecurity and the potential for wild food to make some inroads with respect to that is real. It would apply mostly for people who had access, mostly for people who were probably living in rural circumstances, but through the sharing networks, we might actually be able to get a lot of that food to reach a lot more people. Yeah. But we first have to focus on it as a possibility. Yeah, right? and, and you talked about it in the earlier piece we did about, part of that is just looking at the landscape in terms of how much wild food 
is it capable Absolutely. of producing? Absolutely. And, you know, I grew up in a rural place of 500 people. And I, I took for granted, probably like you did in Newfoundland, mm -hmm. how connected my food was to that landscape. Yep. And I cared for it and yep. I, I paid attention to it as did yep. everybody because yep. our food security, though I'd never heard of the term no, food of insecurity not. at yep. that time, yep. uh, was connected to that landscape, how clean, productive, you know, the water, the, the climate cycles, the, the everything else. Mm -hmm. And so I do think when you say that it, it could play a significant role in rural areas. Yeah. Uh, that makes complete sense to me. I mean, you have, uh, you know, I don't buy very much beef, not because I don't like it, but I, I do. But, you know, we have access to a lot of wild meat where I come from. And so it's, that's mostly what we eat. And of course, we have wonderful fish beef. Yes, where we for live. Sure. Um, so we're very, very lucky that way. Um, but, you know, you, you don't have to think too hard about it when, you, when you're talking about Certainly big animals like elk and moose, for example, you know, a family that takes an elk mm -hmm. or takes a moose, <clears throat> you basically have almost enough meat for, you know, a small family for a full year yes. in that one animal. Yep. There it is. Uh, so, you know, it, there are ways, uh, I firmly believe, to, uh, to, to increase uh, the potential of these harvests. Uh, I believe there is no crime against managing land. It doesn't have to be allowed to all rise and fall uh, as though, you know, there's no interaction amongst all of the creatures on this planet. Uh, the Native Americans here and indigenous peoples all over the world taught us very early, this is where we learned it all from, uh, taught us very early, because we all were indigenous peoples at one time and we all were tribal peoples and native peoples or peoples that were discovering new things. Um, you know, they, they taught us that heavily managed lands could be made the most productive and the most livable for human beings. So I have yeah. nothing against, you know, managing and manipulating land, doing it in the right way, of course. Right. And I think there's a growing appetite for this idea of, of managing land in more diverse ways, of getting us back to more native species and all these kinds of things and contributing to the environment that way. And I really do believe that, you know, the big transformation would be if every piece of land we looked at, we looked at it and said, how much food could this land produce? Not under the plow necessarily, right. or maybe with some of it under the plow and a lot of it not under the plow, whatever that combination mm -hmm. might be. I think it would transform the way we, we could feed ourselves and there would be a, a great many benefits health-wise and otherwise for us. Yeah. So we get into this concept of wild food, and we've touched on it in the past, but you talk about sharing, and there's the cultural part of sharing, but the real practical part of sharing of wild food is, yeah, I love it when you always say, well, if you went down to the meat market and bought a, a pork loin or a beef <laughs> roast, would you go share it with your neighbor? But yeah. the sharing aspect of this expands, uh, and when I say of this, I mean of the wild food and the wild harvest, expands to so many places in so many ways that it's hard to touch on all of them and give them their full credit, but the sharing aspect is, is something that you, you haven't, you, are you guys even developing like a sharing index or, or something yeah, to that effect? Yeah, we, we have run surveys now in Texas, Wyoming, Nevada, um, Arizona and in Alaska, where we have, you know, done a survey of the hunters in those states and actually asked them, you know, how much of their food they do share. And the results indicate that the vast majority of people, the vast, vast majority, I mean, 85 to 90 percent of all hunters share their food. A lot of them share their food, of course, in their immediate household. But mm -hmm. what's even kind of more intriguing is just how many additional people outside the household they actually share that food with. And there's various components of that because, you know, there are quite a number of programs like Feeding the Hungry and right. things of this nature where people who really are disadvantaged in terms of food security can be given, you know, wild foods as a part of a sort of a, an organized community, a general effort to, to help right. in that way. And that's a beautiful thing also. But 
the, the, behind the scenes, there is this, you know, Randy going and sharing with his neighbors and Shane going and sharing with his neighbors. And, you know, we have 12 and a half to 13 million hunters in the United States of America, uh, 95% of them, let's say, who are willing to go and share their meat with somebody. It doesn't take it very long to think about the number of people being impacted. I mean, let's say the average number, and we'll soon have these figures, but let's say the average number of people shared with is, is five. Right. Well, that would mean that instead of 12 million people benefiting from that food, it's 60 million people right. benefiting. Well, it was more than that. It's 72 million people sharing if it's five additional or people five outside. Additional, yeah. So, you know, and all of a sudden you look at it, well, we have 330 million people in America. Is it, that's what it is now, that's something like that? There. Yeah. 330 million people living in the United States right now, and all of a sudden 65 million of them are having some meals of wild food. Now you start to connect that with this idea that when you do a public survey of people in the United States and Canada, you ask them, do you support you know, regulated, you know, legal, you know, uh, uh, hunting for, for food, well, you got at least 72 million people based on that statistic who are probably going to likely say, well, I think it's pretty good because I get a meal every now and then. <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is again, the, the kind of power. It, it's, it, it's, it, first of all, there is the way that we can represent the hunter. So you imagine this figure. I'm an organization that's interested in promoting hunting for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. I personally believe in it or my business depends on it or whatever it might be. All of a sudden the results of this study come out and all of a sudden they start to think about this sharing. And now all of a sudden an image of the hunter is not this beautiful image of a hunter up there, you know, with his rifle on a sling over his shoulder looking out at this broad expanse of habitat. Not the Daniel Boone-esque kind of uh, yeah. uh, view of hunting as I call it. Uh, but you have a, an image of, you know, two little humans with their parents that are, have knocked on a door. Imagine it in the kind of normal Rockwell kind of uh, yeah. aesthetic. And, you know, there's a light over the door and the door is opened and these are obviously the grandparents are st standing there. This could be a short film, but it could be just an Instagram post. And, you know, these children are actually sharing something that for, we make obvious is, you know, my dad got his elk or, yeah. or something of this nature. Now all of a sudden, the impression of the hunter, the image of the hunter in society shifts. Not that there was anything wrong from this kind of noble, independent man or woman who could be out there and you know, could deal with the realities of the natural world and provide for themselves. That's only going to appeal to so many. Right. But all of a sudden you have this thing where the whole family is being united in some way through a gesture of, of kindness uh, that is linking families together. And that is, a, that, that is you know that image has never been used to promote hunting. Right, never. <laughs> and I can tell you it's never been used to promote hunting, but yeah. just think of the power of that. Think of where that would be allowed to be shown. You could put that on a billboard in Chicago. Right. Anyway. Right? You could put that on a billboard anywhere, on the side of an arts and culture building or anything at all, and people would, would, would have a pretty hard time saying there's something wrong with that image of these little children bringing that to their grandparents. Yeah. So this is where I see the, you know, the, the, the hidden power of this uh, being able to come forward eventually. Yeah. So a sharing index, that's, I guess as scientists you can come up with most anything uh, however you want to measure it, but have you done some work or some research in Texas or something about what, yeah, we, what that really, wh how that's really happening? Yeah, we started out in Texas as a, it was our case study, our experiment. Mm -hmm. This is where we wanted to figure out, you know, could we do one of these surveys? We had a lot of questions, you know, can we get access to your database? There were a lot of things we didn't know, whether we could mm -hmm. do it legally or not. And, you know, they work very closely with us, the state of Texas, Texas Parks and Wildlife did, uh, helping us to design the survey, um, helping us get it out to the people and getting the information back. And in the state of Texas, uh, not only did we have this enormous percentage of hunters that actually did share their food, and I think there was about 90% and even more, I think, of the hunters who actually shared, but they were actually reaching, on average, between five and nine people. Mm -hmm. some, those were the sti approximate statistics there. Now, we expect that will be different in each state. It might be less in some states, might be more in some states. You know, in a place like Alaska, it might be more. We don't know. 
Uh, if we were dealing with an indigenous community, it might be a lot more, yeah. right? Uh, and we hope to get into that uh, aspect of things. Hopefully, we'll be able to work with some indigenous communities to, to get this done. But yes, we did use Texas as our as our first study, and we refined the survey as a result of our experience there. We learned the sample size we needed to have back to have the representation for each question where we could actually make some sense from it, you know, that we just were right. giving Shane Mahoney's opinion, you know, this was <laughs> something coming forward. And, uh, we, uh, and now, as I said, we've run these in Wyoming, Nevada, Arizona, and now in... Uh, and just finished the one in Alaska. The data has just come in, and so we've finished the reports on the other states. We've sent them to them for review, and they will come back to us and say, you know, yes, this looks right. We can't see anything wrong with anything here that you did, et cetera, et cetera. And then those uh, results will be uh, become public knowledge and uh, at their discretion. Um, and then, of course, that sets us up for a comparison. Yeah. What's the difference between a Texas and an Alaska, between an Alaska and a Wyoming, between an Arizona and a Nevada with respect to this? And then the questions become a why. Why is it true that hunters, perhaps in one state, share a little bit less than in another state mm -hmm. or more in, in another state? Yeah. And these are the kinds of questions that, um, that come out. And again, Randy, what you have to understand about this wild harvest, like any day at all, you can probably pick up your news feed and read about a game dinner somewhere or a, a nice event where people, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> shared wild meat. Yeah. And those things are fabulous. And they, they largely help to build strength and cohesion within the community of people who are involved. Yeah. But they, in an innocuous kind of friendly way, they bring people who are not necessarily interested in hunting just a little bit into the fold. But again... What we're talking about here is finding out actually the real knowledge base around all of this so we can plan strategies for communication to influence policy and to make change. And you cannot do that with a game dinner. Yeah. You cannot do that with a nice evening. You know, you have right. to you have to do this with the power of knowledge. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But all that stuff related to sharing, I think some of them listening or watching might have grown up in a, I'll call it game sharing, whether it's game fish, whatever. I know I did. I just assumed sharing of food was part of what you did. I, I remember, you know, we'd come home from fishing or we'd come from wherever and my dad would say, bring this over to Vance and Ethel, yep. an elderly couple. Yep. I'd bring it over there and they would be just beyond themselves. Yep. And I, so, I just thought that was always the case. And it's something that I've carried with me through my life and through this acquisition of wild food. Uh, probably a, a big pivot point for me was I'd say 18 or 20 years ago, I would volunteer at our local food bank. Yep. And one of the directors took the volunteers aside and she said, hey, when the wild game comes, be prepared it's the highest demand stuff we have oh, yeah. and uh watching that it was it was like when the light bulb went on for me mm -hmm. like guess what randy not everybody is in a situation where they can be the beneficiary of no game sharing no and not everybody does game sharing i i, I just had this i i guess uh, ignorant view uh, not not just stupid ignorant, but just it was an assumed perspective that everyone does this yeah. or that everyone had the opportunity and benefit of yeah. it because whenever I share, I usually get something in return. Who, who yeah. knows what it's going to well, be? Hey, here's some berries or here, you know. Yeah. So when you talk about this sharing index, I'm going to be really interested to see what that is. Uh, having grown up next to two uh, travel reservation groups, mm -hmm. their sharing aspects made us look stingy. Oh, yeah. And so I, I bet when you break that out by cultural uh, and, and other, uh, if you want to call it identities or, or cultures, uh, you'll see big variations in that, just based on my own observation of what you, I've seen. You will. I, I think that's true. And there are probably some insights that we could predict, and I think there's probably some insights that we completely would fail to predict with regard to this. Yeah. Um, but that's what's important, isn't it? That we 
come to understand this. And all of this is a maturation of the image of hunting, too. Let's not forget that. You know, there are so many things we've talked about even in the last few hours that have never been part of the communication strategies for people around hunting. I, I, right? right? And, and, I, and, we, and we've been in the business. We sure. know what's been out there and what's been happening and so on. So this really has, I think, the capacity to make transformative change. And, um, and, I, and I, I firmly believe that it, that it will. And I think there will be experiments that will come out of this where people will say, well, okay, all right, uh, let's take something like superabundant species, as we call them. You know, we have certainly enormous numbers of snow geese and enormous mm -hmm. numbers of, of Canada geese, for example. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, Canada geese were, were, were really low in numbers at one yeah. point in time. It's hard to believe now, but they were. And in some regions, we have a, you know, we have a lot of white-tailed deer. Some regions now we even have a ton of turkeys. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, and so you know, you can begin people as they start to think about this. You know, well, why wouldn't we harvest them in some way where there is a real intent to share this wild meat? This right. doesn't even have to be about you know increasing it. It means just increasing our offtake of those populations in mm -hmm. order to be able to share, and the benefits that come from that. Um, you know, geese are beautiful animals, but, you know, they poop every six minutes and, you know, that, that, <laughs> that causes, I mean, that's, that's it. I mean, that's, every that's, six that's, minutes? That's what they do, yeah. And so, you know, they, you know, they, they basically, <laughs> therefore, you know, they, they bring a, a series of problems with them that uh, interrupt with, you know, families and parks, yeah. uh, waterways being polluted and so on and so forth. Um, we have superabundance of white-tailed deer in places. Well, we mm -hmm. do have Lyme disease, yeah. and Lyme disease is increasing. And Lyme yeah. disease is nothing to be to be joked about. Right. Uh, and so, you know, uh, by harvesting and providing that wild food, we may be also reducing the density of those animals and the chance that people, you know, are going to be infected and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So, you know, there's um, there are a lot of benefits that if we started to think about this. Now, critics will immediately jump up and say, well, you know, that's going to defy the North American model because you're going to get into things like maybe selling it and things of this right. nature. But, you know, my, my, my reaction to those kinds of sort of knee-jerk reactions to ideas is, why don't you just take just a little bit of time and think about this, yeah. starting at small scale, with a small experiment. You know, you don't mm -hmm. have to throw the doors open and let every colt out. Right. You know, maybe just bring one out at a time and see how he performs or they perform, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. So it's, um, you know, I think it's going to tumble out these kinds of questions once we come out with this kind of data. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things you can't deny, or I, I can't deny anyhow, is the nutritional benefits I feel I get from wild food. Mm -hmm. And yes, I eat my share of purchased food that I know is coming sure. from the industrial agriculture system. Some of which is great by the way, mm -hmm. some yeah. of which is produced really, yeah. really well. But I, I do know, just within the feelings of my own body, the benefits that come from mm -hmm. wild foods. Mm -hmm. And just when it's there, if you say, you know, Randy, you can get this chicken or you can have this rough grouse. Yep. It, it, <laughs> well, of course, there's no choice. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's there's so really no choice. The you know. nutritional benefits. Yep. It gets to be as much a uh, qualitative discussion and less of a quantitative discussion mm -hmm. in many respects. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about people who are concerned about their own health, yep. as we all are, yep. it seems like a wide open window of opportunity mm -hmm. where wild harvest can oh. have a lot of resonance. Well, you know, we tend to look at this in a way where we say, you know, um, we look at wild meats and we, you know, we assess them nutritionally and we say, well, they have, you know, lower cholesterol and lower fat overall and higher in protein, higher in vitamins, higher in minerals in general. And we're finding other things about them, too, that benefit us. And it's kind of um, always interesting to me that we kind of approach it that way. It's like, um, well, when the science is being done on this, people get um, they're kind of a, almost a little surprised that, you know, these... Uh, we know enough about uh, human nutrition now to know what we need, and yet when they look at those wild meats, they find that they seem to provide, you know, all we need and in the right proportions and all these kinds of things. But it's really looking at the question a little bit backwards, isn't it? Because 
those are the foods that made us. <laughs> huh? And, uh, it, you, know, we, we, you know, Cheetos didn't create human beings, right? I mean, it, it was... Uh, I do love Cheetos <laughs> once in a while, though. Uh, and so, the, uh, uh, you know, these are the foods that our, our bodies uh, were, were built with. They, mm -hmm. Our physiologies were adapted to. We were able to use them, and we, and we, we used them effectively. And, of course, wild meat played such a profound um, role in the nutrition of human beings yeah. for such a very, very long time that, of course, uh, you know, when we rediscover them, they work perfectly because, you know, the human beings that came out of Africa 70,000 years ago, um, we are essentially them, and they w were essentially us. Mm -hmm. um, we have really not changed hardly at all. We've had regional differences between people that show up as different races, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. of today. Um, but in general, our, you know, our, our cranial capacities have been within a specific range. None of us uh, developed, you know, groups that had three arms and only one leg. Uh, you, know, we, uh, you know, we have the same intelligence, we have the same hearts, we have the same livers, we have the same, all of these kinds of things. Virtually none of that has fundamentally changed in that 70,000 years. It's too short a period of time without strong directional selection for that to have happened. We do have some groups, as I said, more likely to have blue eyes, the people who live near you know, glacial mountains and so on and so forth. We have people whose skin color is different because they lived in places that had much more intense sunshine and things. Mm -hmm. Yes, but overall, the human being is the human being is the human being and the foods that created the human being and the forms of hominin, the pre precursors of, of human beings that go back several million years once we started to hunt, most of those foods were exactly the same and our organs developed to maximize the benefits from those foods. So now when we run up against those foods now, you know, it's probably a little guy inside us to say, we, we, you know, all of a sudden we're back here, you know, this <laughs> stuff is coming in. So it's not as though it's just, you know, there's some kind of phenomenal good fortune that this has happened. It's yeah. the way it has been. We departed from that, yeah. not that ever departing from us. Yeah. Which makes it so uh, almost, uh, how, my response is when you read that stuff and people think it's a big discovery or a, yeah. an aha moment, for me it's like, oh. <laughs> I didn't know that was a mystery. No, I thought we always knew that, but the truth of the matter is we didn't. But we are discovering, you know, in addition to the benefits of the wild foods themselves, we are also discovering, of course, through real medical research, the, the benefits of being in the outdoors and being in the yeah. circumstances where we do harvest these things, too. Yeah. And, and that is, again, sort of reaffirming what we've always felt, you know, this sense of well-being we feel when we are in nature. Uh, you know, all of us have experienced it, whether we're floating a river or whether we're, 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 we're you know, we're hunting moose on the, the fens of Newfoundland. It, I mean, it's, you have this kind of reaction and hunters and non-hunters, everybody mm -hmm. who spends time in the outdoors has exactly the same reaction. Um, and, uh, but now these things we always said, you know, I feel great. I don't worry about things. I'm, I'm focused in the moment. I'm just enjoying what's around me. Uh, it's a great time. It brings me closer to family and with my friends. I really, really, I don't know. There's something different about it. You know, people will use right. all kinds of expressions. Yep. But now medical research is showing fully that, you know, you know, indices, you know, particularly blood indices and, and things related to blood pressure and uh, other issues of that nature, hypertension and so on, that these are all being affected. Mm -hmm. And the level of st stress hormones in our, uh, in our bodies, the corticosteroids and so on, that these are, these are all lowered or non-elevated when we are in those circumstances. Yeah. So this is where the phenomenon in places like Japan, where you go to these you know, rest bathing forests, you know, where you go and just visit the forests and sit amongst the trees and so on and so forth. You know, some people look at that and say, well, that's all a bit strange. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, people who put blood pressure straps around their arms and so on and so forth, you know, we can actually measure and see differences that are, that are occurring as a result yeah. of people being there. So when you double that up with the pursuit of wild food, you go into those circumstances where all of those medical advantages that come. You are exercising, first of all. You're often doing good things for both st uh, strength training and cardio. Um, and then you're out there uh, developing skills and knowledge of the outdoors, which can be very beneficial in many ways. 
Uh, you're learning to identify nature, and we know the more we can identify nature, the more plants we know, the more insects we know, the more birds we know, the more mammals we know, etc., the more we enjoy being in that space. And then you come out of there with this wild food that is the original food upon w for which your body was built, and so that that healthful experience is extended on into that, into that circumstance. Yeah. So no matter how you slice it, no pun intended, you know, this wild food business is a, is a, is a healthy one. Yeah. It's a big healthy one. Yeah. And, you know, I, you read all this stuff now about just the mental wellness that the, the natural yeah. world can provide. And my wife, she's, I mean, she's obviously... A, way more observant than I am of, of me and my own mannerisms. Yep. And there's many times she will say, you should go for a hike or you should go do this. Mm -hmm. You look stressed yep. or you, yep. you seem like, yep. and I'll come back and I'll be like, dang, she's right. So yep. the, I know that's all anecdotal, but when I read all these studies that talk about the mental wellness yep. of the natural world, I could give you so many examples, Shane, in my personal life that confirm yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. I never, I, I never, I would never have the the wherewithal or the intelligence to put it in a, a finding or a study, mm. but it sure resonates with me because I feel it. Well, you know, you know yourself, right? One knows oneself, and but now we are gradually starting to accumulate this 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 kind of knowledge, and we are beginning to understand the the role that it plays. It's like you know, even pediatricians, you know, uh, the whole study of pediatrics and, you know, how we should raise children and, and, and how we should allow children to feed. I mean, it's, 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 it, it's known so well that it's beyond debate that, you know, uh, little humans, when they can't yet walk and can only crawl and so on and so forth, have this incredible tendency, as we all know, to grab things and to put it in their mouths. And whether that's a moth or whether that's a, an earthworm or whether that's a, a handful of soil or whatever it might be, it, you know, they're driven to do this, of course. And we now know full well that it is the ingestion of, of some of those things, and particularly Earth itself, that can actually provide building components for the immune systems of, of, of small humans that eventually, you know, allow them to grow into to healthier people. What you don't want to have for a child is a sterile environment where, you know, that, that, that's germ-free. I mean, you don't, want to, you don't want to bathe them in a bath of bacteria either. You know, I'm not trying to be extreme <laughs> here. But, but, you know, but you know, here's your favorite bacteria soap or something. But, you know, uh, you do want to have children exposed to these natural microbes and other things in the natural environment just like it is absolutely necessary to provide children with dangerous play. I mean, we all grew up as children with and did insane things as children <laughs> in terms of dangerous say. play. And yeah. it, it's a different world now. We all recognize that. But it just comes back to this whole nature experience. Um, little humans are no different than big humans. You know, they need, at their level, their interactions with nature too. Yeah. And it can't all be stuff we teach them. It needs to be stuff they discover on their own that maybe mom and dad don't really like, like, you know, eating an earthworm or whatever that might be, you know. But they need to discover that on their own, and it can't always be, you know, get up and wash your hands and, you know, don't put your hand in your mouth and all that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, there are growing numbers of doctors who will say the very best thing you should do is not clean your hands and stick your hand in your mouth. And, uh, and I'm with them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jane, my wife is going to think you've fallen off your rock because my wife has soap everywhere. But uh, so I feel that um, I was born in 1964 as the last of the baby boomer years. I feel like I grew up in this world where science and advancements in medicine were going to save us all. And... Over the last 15 or 20 years of my life, we've seen some remarkable stuff. Yeah, we have. But all of my doctors, all the people I know who are doctors say, you know, prevention, moderate exercise, healthy diet. Yep. That, that's going to do more for you than all of these scientific miracles. Yeah. Uh, that is true. Wild food in the process of going out and acquiring it just seems like it's made for that. It is made for it. And of course, that wild food can be extended too to, uh, to small scale agriculture or gardens, you know, food, mm -hmm. you know, vegetable food that you 
grow your cells. But again, that's a natural process. You know, you fertilize it with cape, uh, with kelp or rotting fish or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. pig manure or whatever it might be. And of course, you see the same phenomena there in the sense it's not quite as extreme, but it is there where people who, who garden, raise their own vegetables, uh, very much want to share that with, with neighbors and friends oh, yeah. too. So that's another example. And, and of course, we went from the hunter-gatherer to the, to the agriculturalist gradually over time more and more. And the hunter-gatherer tradition, even places where we didn't stamp it out deliberately, began to die back in, in lots of cases because of, you know, it was convenient to have your own food growing. But, um, you know, the, uh, the, the advantage of having access to things that you yourself have been able to acquire or to grow yourself is an extraordinary thing. The great advantages in medical science, if you look at them from their two, uh, you know, the two, this kind of simplest conceptual model, there are the things that we've come to learn about the human body that, and mind, and physiology that um, provide us with insights as to what the basic requirements are for a healthy, fulsome, and happy life. And a lot of that is associated with, you know, these kinds of experiences, reducing stress and having some moderate exercise and having good food and so forth. And the other major component, of course, has been the the virtually miraculous research that has allowed us to both test and in some cases treat diseases when they do occur. Right. And the thing is, if we could maximize both, you know, the prevention side of things where fewer people became ill and developed those illnesses later in life and deferred the cost to the medical systems, and also develop these better diagnostic techniques and treatments, um, then of course we'd really be getting to a stage where, you know, we would really be optimizing the two benefits of this. But for a very long period of time, the emphasis on medical research was to improve drugs, as I said, diagnostic things and pour stuff into you to get rid of the bad thing that happened to you that in some cases happened to you because of lifestyle choices that you made. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this, this is a weird question I just got to ask because uh, for me, I'm 57. I'm starting to think about the exertions required to go and pack that elk off the mountain this mm -hmm. fall. Has anyone ever done a study about what the physical exercise benefits of hunting and fishing and wild harvest are? Or is that just... I don't know if anyone has ever... I, I can't recall um, a specific study, I guess, that sort of encapsulated that. But certainly there's a lot of tests of what... Uh, Mountain training, for example, which would be somewhat similar, and carrying heavy packs for mountaineering purposes, uh, you know, what that requires and how that can be used to actually develop people with, you know, very high strength factors and, and high cardiovascular factors with low, you know, blo low blood pressure, low heartbeat, you know, all the kinds of things that are indicative of, of, of high class athletes. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot more of this that's going to come. Um, and, um, and, you know, there'll be the difference between, you know, the person who hunts the elk or the sheep or, you know, a mountain right. ungulate of some kind and the person who, um, you know, you know, just walks through stubble fields and shoots pheasant or something, yeah. you know, there's, there's different things, but each one of them is bringing something, but I'm not aware of any classic studies, but that doesn't mean they don't exist for sure. There's a lot of people that say there's spiritual benefits of wild harvest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I making that up, or do I feel a little bit different when I'm out there, and I'm just the weird duck? No, oh, I don't think so. I mean, I think there's um, any time we go back to nature, as I've said, there's going to be a sense of deja vu, a sense of, of rediscovery that can take place in um, a lot of varied environments. Um, they don't all have to be in the outdoors, even. Um, you know, if you go to a steakhouse that's well lit, you'll pay $12 for your steak. And if you go to a steakhouse that's, the interior is done with wood and stone and there are open fires burning and the wall outlets and things of this nature, then of course you pay $45 for your steak. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, the retreat uh, that many people, and in particular this is true of, of women, I think, um, who find a retreat, you know, in a warm bath, for example, mm 
mm-hmm. is another example of that kind of trying to find this kind of natural comfort. Um, there is this issue, as I've talked about many times, despite all of our technologies, that we try to find this comfort in the low flickering light of the candle that makes such a difference to us on so many, at so many levels. So, so I, I think, think that, that um, when we venture afield, of course, um, there is this sense of belonging. Uh, there is this, this, what I call the sense of rightful place. Huh. And, um, and this has many emotional impacts that, of course, reflect themselves in physiological measurements, as we just talked about, in terms of health uh, consequences. And, of course, we know that the, um, you know, so much of our spirituality that we have codified, that we recognized in religious beliefs, of course, came uh, often in association with hunting cultures, though not exclusively, but there was a great deal of this kind of, you know, mythology that was born out of our relationships with mm-hmm. them, with the, the wild others that, that we share this planet with. Um, and uh, that led to, you know, incredibly uh, strange things, you know. Um, if, if, if wild animals lose a member of their pack or a member of their uh, family, uh, they don't bury them. Uh, but, of course, we began to do this a very, very long uh, time ago, many hundreds of thousands of years ago. And uh, so uh, us and peoples like us, like Neanderthal, for example, also buried his dead. So I think there is both the aspect of the spiritual in the sense that we talk about feeling that we're part of something much bigger than ourselves, which is part of spirituality. Mm-hmm part of something we don't control, but which we can be a beautiful part of, uh, that's the spiritual experience. And then part of the the thinking about what happens to us all, you know, where do we go after death? Um, You know, where would be a beautiful place to die? I mean, these kinds of questions I'm sure have come to lots of people who have spent time in the field and lots of hunters have had this, these kinds of experiences. And as a matter of fact, sometimes you can reach a state in nature, when you're there for a long time, um, without break, you can reach a state in nature where uh, you suddenly realize that the feeling, the sense that you have, is that you really don't care if you die or you don't, even in that particular moment. And if that somebody told you you had to move from this space and this view and this feeling, this moment, and if you don't do it, you will die, and if you do do it, you will live, you might just as be you might be just as likely to say, "Well, that's fine. I'm not going to leave this moment." Yeah. So those spiritual experiences are real, and then of course they get can get amplified at certain times of the day. And the nighttime, of course, was always an amazing time for impacting our psyche that yeah. way. Whether it's the stars or whether it's the light of the fire against this this sea of darkness that extends out from beyond it, the, all of that led us to these spiritual experiences. And of course, the, the things we see in nature. I mean, the, you know, the fact that you, know, you, look at a, uh, you look at an elk and its calf feeding, and you know, the calf is at the stage where it's still taking some milk from the mother, but it's also beginning to forage on its own. And you know, it doesn't take but a moment's reflection to realize you know, the the female is eating these foods, this, these grasses, these things, etc. And uh, out of that, she is producing a substance that looks completely unlike what she's chewing. <laughs> it's this sort of this green mixture of, you know, the salad that she's taking in. She produces this beautiful white substance um, that is feeding this calf. At the same time, this little calf is also starting to feed on that salad and. All of a sudden, you know, there's this idea of connectivity, right, of spirituality uh, that is there. And so many other things, uh, emotional things like that, speak to us. You know, we, 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 we see a bird flying on high on the wing and, you know, with, with definite purpose, you know, it's headed somewhere. Yeah. It could be a raven, but it could also be a goose or whatever it might be. And you, you just wonder, you know, where is that soul 
headed for, you know. I, I wish I knew with that, you know. So, no, I, I think there are all of these things. And I don't think you have to be a hunter either, by the way, to experience that. I think you can be somebody who just spends a lot of time in nature and is observant when you're there to get this kind of an idea. I just released a film called Hunting and the Art of Human Existence that, I saw that. T talks about yeah. a lot of these ideas and about well, I'm just convinced that, you know, art, technology and, you know, these these profound human attributes, including religion, they, they all came from those experiences. And we we have to remember, Randy, that, you know, no matter how much we talk about being hunters, I, I spent a lot more time with wild animals as a non-hunter than as a hunter because of what my work was. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was fortunate to do both and to spend, you know, really long periods of time with them alone and in in wilderness areas where there were no roads and the only access was by aircraft. And, uh, you know, um, um, for for a lot of us, the, the, the windows of engagement are short. They're five-day hunts or they might be two-day hunts or right. whatever they might be. Yeah. But I think the other thing about this spiritual aspect is that the longer you spend there, uh, the more you're likely to feel that way. And in my experience as a research biologist, which was pretty extreme, um, I found that it was about three weeks. And that by about three weeks, I, I really could sense a, a different feeling in myself if I had not left that space, that area, you know, and was with animals all the time. That suddenly, at about that time, it became, um, it just became effortless. You didn't, gradually over that time, you forgot to think about even things you perhaps should have been thinking about that would have been important. You, you, you just weren't doing it, you know. Yeah. So I don't think there's any doubt that that's, that that's real. And uh, people capture it at different levels. You know, people have their cottages where they love to go. They, they feel it there. Yeah. Some people have to go much further afield than that, you know, to find it. Yeah. But I think we all find it there. Yeah. I, and I think it's, we're going home. We, we think about how many people we know who have said, when I die, scatter my ashes mm -hmm. on this mountain. Or when yeah. I die, yeah. bury me here. Or yeah. It's not like they just picked the place off a map. There was some spiritual connection. To oh, absolutely. That. And their, whatever their spiritual belief of the afterlife. It oh, it's totally. And that all comes from, I think, their experiences out there in nature. Hey, just, absolutely. Well, returning home, it's just, uh, I mean, at, it's, it's at a cosmic scale. It's kind of like if you were traveling for a long time and you finally drive up to your home and you know all of a sudden you're going to go in and it's going to be predictable you know the dog is going to be there and you know you're going to know where the where the cold beer is in the fridge or whatever it might be you know it's all going to be there and you have this sense of relief you just come from these airports and these 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 numbing discussions with people about can you find your bag or not find your bag and all those kinds of things well that has a little bit of similarity to it you feel this sense of of homeness but in nature, of course, it's cosmic. Uh, we, I mean, we know it's where we came from. We know it's where we belong. You know, there's a reason why, there's a reason why we can drink the water from rivers and eat the flowers of plants and survive. Yeah. It's because that's who we are. That's what we are, right? <laughs> How we got here. Yeah, yeah. So I know I'm a firm believer in this, uh, in this spiritual aspect of things. And I, I think the world will be a better place if more people can actually experience that. And Part of the problem, I guess, we face in a lot of ways today is we have so many people, and at a certain point, the numbers of people that are sharing the same space or experience with us, like in a big national park or something like this, at some level it intrudes on that. Right. Uh, and and the, the mathematics don't quite work anymore, you know. Yeah. And then... We still have the space, the mountains are there, you know, the, the springs are there, the, the whatever is there. There might even be bison that we can see and that will entice us for the moment or whatever. But this feeling of, there has to be a certain level, I think, of a feeling of aloneness uh, to bring the psychological and spiritual aspects of it to, to the fore. Yeah. Well, it is uh, a reality we're facing mm. with a growing planet, but... 
I think this has been a good piece, Shane, talking, you know, starting from all of the ways that food is procured and me kind of giving you the Randy Newberg week at the at the dinner table. The buffet. Yeah. Down through, you know, all the sharing aspects, the health benefits, the mental health benefits, the spiritual aspects. And, uh, you know, if there's maybe one thing we haven't touched on, it's just how varied all this is among cultures and traditions and how we as, if you want to call us tribes, mm -hmm. as you said, we've all been tribal in our lives. We are tribal. You know, there's a lot of differences in that, but I enjoy examining and learning those differences because mm -hmm. the natural world and my pursuit of natural food has affected me and created my own culture or view of the world. But my experiences have been different than somebody who lives in Greenland or sure, somebody who lives in sub-Saharan Africa or yep. somewhere. And so you look at all those cultural variations and differences and some people find them, I, I don't know if this is the right term, uh, they critique them. Hmm. For me, I'm interested in them. Sure, it's like, of course. What were the experiences that were different than mine that led to, to such varied cultural traditions? Well, you know, Geist, Geist and I produced the book on the North American model two and a half, well, three years ago now, I guess. You know, there was a, we, you know, one of the things we wanted to address with these ideas of, you know, challenges or problems or deficiencies, you know, that, uh, that certain cr critics of the model, and I'm all for criticism of the model, that's fine. I, you know, it's, it's um, that's all good. But, but, to, but to me, the, you know, the one really fundamental thing that's missing is the fact that um, it was built totally by um, a European view. Yeah. And that the experiences and the, the deep, deep, you know, millennia old knowledge of the many uh, Native American uh, peoples uh, who were here uh, was not only never captured, it was sort of by and large forcibly excluded as they themselves were forcibly excluded. Yeah. And so um, we sit today with a handful of texts that we can refer to as to how they lived, where some, you know, clear-eyed observers and empathetic people went to live with them and to observe them and to simply record the, their ways of life and their ways of living. Um, and out of those, we gain some, what we certainly gain is sufficient insight to lament forever what we missed in not learning from them. Um, how they lived, why they did the things that they did, and why they manipulated the environment in the way they did, what their full experience and knowledge of nature was with regard to predators, for example. I mean, just imagine, just imagine the, the insights that could have come our way in terms of how we should have thought about uh, predators and predator reconstruction and recolonization and reintroduction and so on and so <laughs> forth in the system. Had we had all of that knowledge that you know, goes back, in some cases, maybe 30,000 years. Certainly, in a lot of cases, went back 15,000 years. Mm -hmm. And at the time that, you know, from Jamestown and Salem to the, to, the, to the time in this country when the North American model's principles were being fomented and developed in the late 1800s, early, uh, uh, or the late 1900s, 1800s, uh, and into the early part of the 20th century, um, you know, it, it, we, we just would have had this this extraordinarily different view because that view was only 400 years old at best. Yeah, their views were potentially 30,000 years old. Yeah. Now you imagine what comes down to a culture after 30 thousand years of living <laughs> on the land. <laughs> and I mean on the land, right, right Jeff? Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the ebbs and flows of yeah. climate and, yeah. and weather and disease and um, productivity and abundance. And, no, I, I yeah. think that's one of the great parts about wild harvest. If you want to look at the, you know, kind of reflecting on what you said there, it's a bit of a, of a lost opportunity or a lost knowledge set. Yep. But 
maybe wild harvest is the place where some of that can be brought yeah. forth, whether it's indigenous knowledge or local knowledge of whoever. Of course. That I mean, and I, I think, think that's, that's true. And I think, and I think that's, that's what, what, you know, globally, we are now striving for a much better understanding and inclusion of what we call IPLCs, which is indigenous peoples and local communities, whether they're indigenous or not. Because I think there's a global recognition, and this is true in the Convention on Biodiversity, the Convention on Migratory Species, CITES, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species, etc. There's a recognition that that knowledge uh, was set aside, and most of the knowledge is, of course, what we learn through, you know, mostly orthodox Western science, which has its strengths. But of course, one thing it doesn't have is this longevity of experience. Yeah. Because it's not that old, right? And yeah. So I, I think we are uh, at this turning point of trying to be more inclusive. And there's a lot of growing pains with that. There's a lot of historical tensions. There's a lot of historical realities that are simply impossible to dismiss. They're also impossible to recapture. Um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I drive through the state of Montana or uh, anywhere really in this country or in Canada, and I look at you know, someone has a beautiful home on a, on a, on a beautiful, you know, small crest above a, a beautiful river and, you know, the, the horses out in the, in the, you know, the pasture there. And, uh, you know, it, it just looks, it looks incredible. And you think, well, what about today? You know, someone landed, you know, from the sky and just came down and, kind of just walked up and said, well, you know, you've kind of had your time, um, but uh, we need this land now for our purposes. Yeah. And think about what the reaction would be of the people here who own that land and who love that land. Right. And in many cases, a lot of those people might have bought that land in the last 25 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. They hadn't ridden and walked over it for the last fifteen to twenty-five thousand. Yeah. I, I don't know, know what, what the solution to that is, but it remains to me. Uh, I call it the greatest vacancy in the North American model. I really do believe it was, and I really believe that if we could have formulated a model that would have been the best of our, you know, sort of our European thinking and the best of the indigenous peoples' thinking here, we could really have created something even better. Yeah. You know, and uh, so that has to remain, you know, just this kind of historic sadness, I guess, yeah. that we, we have to carry with us. Yeah, it, it, it is. But to maybe soften that a little bit is I see how much work or how much of the work products that you put out reflect yeah, appreciation for that and trying to incorporate that, that and giving true. it the same balance it deserves. Yeah. So. That is true. I feel very strongly about this because uh, um, I just see that um, you know, you know, people will ask you questions sometimes when they meet you. You know, what do you think? You know, what's the? They can get philosophical sometimes. They say, you know, what's the best way of getting through life? And I said, well, I, I don't really think there's the best way to getting through life. I can only tell you that. Life happens to us, not the other way around. That's principle number one. And, and, uh, and the second thing is, you know, that, um, that um, freedom, uh, you know, freedom owned is, you know, a precious thing, but freedom denied has to be the most powerful pain in the world. Yeah. And that is essentially what happened with the Native American cultures here, you know, the best horsemen in the world, the best small cavalry in the world, the, you know, the people who could empty their bow faster. They could shoot six arrows into the air faster than a cavalry man could empty his revolver. Yeah. It was tested time and time and time again. Yeah. You, know. you can only imagine what they knew, right? Yeah. Yeah. Of wildlife and of wildlife systems and all of this kind of thing, and we have such tiny parts of it yeah. that we can relate to. But perhaps, perhaps through this food gathering thing, we can find at least some common dialogue yeah. about this. Well, there's 
some concepts out there that are kind of touching on some of that. You know, I don't know if you'd call it a, a campaign. I know the Center for Disease Control and a whole bunch of other groups are involved yeah. in this. It's called One Health. Yeah. And so much of it is like, well, wild food and, and the yeah. activities related to wild food seem so well suited for this. What is One Health? Well, it's, a, it's actually an old idea. Mm -hmm. um, the first time that I can sort of find reference to it in any kind of literature uh, goes back to the 19th century, actually. And it was a German physician, uh, and he was also an anthropologist, so he had this kind of put it out there with uh, uh, sort of double world view, if you will, from his professional background and training who ventured forth this idea that, you know, we ought to be thinking about health as health of humans and health of wildlife in one sort of comprehensive um, view. Mm -hmm. um, and like many ideas that can be even very great ideas, it lay dormant, you know, for a long time. It's kind of like the cicadas, only it stayed in the, stayed in the soil an awful lot longer, you know, than, mm -hmm. than they well. do. Um, and then we saw, you know, in uh, around the, the early 2000s, we, we started to see bits and pieces of this sort of bubbling up. Um, and they, they started to bubble up, you know, because of different experiences that were taking place in the world. And we began to see crossover effects between wildlife and ourselves with diseases yep. and zoonotics and so on and so forth. And... Um, Gradually, uh, you know, various conservation discussions were held at various large meetings uh, all in the last few, couple of decades talking about this kind of program. And then, of course, all of that was further emphasized in recent time by, you know, a number of zoonotic effects, avian flu, SARS, you know, these things, but also, of course, most emphatically in the last couple of years by COVID. Yeah. And... Um, this brought home to us, you know, uh, most forcefully the fact that it is possible, of course, for very severe diseases that will have massive health as well as socioeconomic implications for humanity actually, you know, come from, can come from, and many of them do come from, these viral diseases. They originate in wildlife species or animal species. Yeah. And, of course, the... The lesson that ought to be first of all taken from that, which never is, because this is never what people want to talk about at the time of crisis, is that the, the very fact that we are able to be the inheritors of their diseases, of the others, of the other wild others' diseases, is because we share so much in common with them. Mm -hmm. If we didn't share so much in common with them biologically, physiologically, etc., you know, these viruses would end up in a completely foreign environment and they would just die and they'd rot and they would be gone. Yeah. But it's because we are so much like them that, of course, they get into our systems and, and we, can, we can develop the, the illnesses and the diseases. So this led to a, I mean, a very intense debate over the last three to four years, which I was heavily involved in at an international level, where you had, uh, you know, some very strong opinions being put forward that, you know, the answer to this question of zoonotics and pandemics, in other words, diseases that come from animals to us and can, in some cases, be transferred back, that um, the real answer to this was, of course, was to lay off uh, entirely the use and trade and consumption of wild animals. So most North Americans are not aware of the intensity of the efforts that were made by many very highly placed organizations to actually come out and say, okay, now finally you see what we mean. This is why we should not be doing any harvesting of wild creatures anywhere in the world. Really? So this went on for about 18 months to two years in which we would be going back and forth through ver various institutions, um, groups I'm associated with like the IUCN and so on and the Cooperative Partnership and Sustainable Wildlife Management which includes some of the big powerful conservation organizations in the world uh, CITES and Traffic and FAO and IUCN and so on we all wrote letters and sign on letters in which we opposed the, this reaction to mm -hmm. this and said do you, first of all do you have any idea what an impact that would have on human populations globally to deny them access Based on the earlier comments we've shared in this yeah. in this show, you know, billions of people would be affected directly and negatively, um, and that 
In part, what we, of course, needed to do was to manage the systems better, understand what we were doing in trade circumstances where maybe we shouldn't be, you know, keeping animals in wet markets or doing things like that. There were lots of steps we could take, improve our management of habitat, you know, mm -hmm. keep domestic livestock out of wild animal spaces and vice versa and all this kind of... There were lots of things that we could do before we should start thinking about condemning, you know, half the human race to starvation. <laughs> you know, it seemed a fairly uh, Christian thing to propose, you know, that we might want to take it slow here. Uh, and, and so uh, eventually, you know, we, we've come to a point where, you know, a, a lot of that got softened and the, the conventions are not reflecting that kind of extreme viewpoint. But what also happened then, um, there became a great deal of emphasis on the pure disease side of it. You know, mm. how do we control the transmission of the disease? Um, how do we monitor effectively to, to, to find if the disease is there? And then how do we mobilize resources to treat the disease? So this is the kinds, these are the kinds of things uh, that are examples of the kinds of points of emphasis groups like the CDC and others placed okay. upon this. And, and understandably so, that's, that's, that's what they work on. Mm -hmm. But there have been a number of us um, who have been arguing uh, that now is the time to actually resurrect some of the original ideas. Uh, uh, the gentleman's name was Virchow, I think, in, in 19th century Germany, who proposed this idea. It's time now to take a holistic look at this and not only look at what happens with the disease, but to ask ourselves what are the underlying factors that lead to the emergence of these diseases and the transmissions. And these are often, as I said, related to how we interact with wild habitats, how we are constantly encroaching on ever more wild and inaccessible right. habitats, how we are increasingly mixing biotas by mixing the resident populations of animals, whether they be bats or other species, and bats do harbor an enormous range of viruses. Um, and, you know, maybe the domestic animals they have, that, that we have, that we live with all the time. We could contract the disease through direct consumption of meat, like bat meat or bush meat or other animals that are infected in between. Mm -hmm. But the point is that we needed to look at the drivers, the socioeconomic circumstances of the people and the places where these things come from. Why is the demand there for these kinds of products? Uh, what are the socio-political circumstances that are responsible for these circumstances where massive numbers of people live in poverty despite the nations might be wealthy in minerals and all kinds of things right. that their people are poor you know what these are the driving forces that we need to really come at at the same time that we develop these better monitoring and you know and treatments and so on for the disease so this has really expanded the one health idea out of the domain exclusively of what we might call the medical hmm. and disease treatment world and brought it into the wildlife management world. So I'm a firm believer that because states in the United States and provinces in Canada, for example, have responsibility for managing wildlife habitats and wildlife populations and so forth, then they must be integrally involved in this discussion of One Health. Mm -hmm. Even if it's only from the disease point of view, they still, we still need to recognize that they're the ones managing these populations, whether it's wild pigs or migratory birds or whatever it right. might be that can be harbors of this. But more importantly, I think this idea of One Health is kind of the future view of ecology that, is, that will bring the human ecology and the ecology of all other species together. Hmm. As I've said many times, you know, we are, we are a part of nature. There, we, absolutely nothing that science has given us, nothing and absolutely no genetic restructuring of humanity has occurred since we left Africa except the most minor of things, like I said, eye color in some cases, or things of this nature. And so we still remain the same as the people who we would have easily identified as totally dependent on nature. They came out with, you know, whatever they were wearing, and, you know, they lived on it every day. Yeah. And um, I think this gives us the chance to make this, this direct uh, link between healthy systems, healthy streams, healthy landscapes, um, healthy wildlife and healthy people. Because I can assure you that if there are landscapes out there that, that cannot support the normal biota that they did always support for you know, the thousands of years since this place has been ice-free, there is something wrong 
out there. And that something wrong is not just bad for elk or coyotes or wolves or shirus moose or pelicans or rainbows or cutthroats or brook trout or whatever the circumstance might be. <clears throat> These are things that are ultimately bad for humanity. We may be a step or two away from feeling the direct impacts because we have all of this stuff in between us and them. Yeah. But in the end, we will not survive without that clean water. We will not survive without that clean air. We will not survive without good flood retention. We will not survive if we're burned to, you know, as crispy critters in, you know, conflagrations that we simply cannot c control. And so the One Health thing is, I think, a, a very broad-based uh, proposal for rethinking our relationship with nature in a very fundamental way that, by the way, is very very indigenous in its in its viewpoints mm, that we're all brothers you know, we're, we're all yeah. together in this um and but of course was also occurring to physicians and anthropologists as far you know a hundred years ago and more um right now um you know uh um, you know state agencies are taking a very strong interest in this mm -hmm. and and provincial agencies are as well and i'm work, working very heavily in the in the one health sphere now uh, internationally because I really believe that it's a way for us to build inclusivity of all views, of all peoples, uh, a concern for all of wildlife, and a concern for all of the natural systems that we have, including the natural systems that may have been manipulated on public lands by actions we took or on private lands by actions we took. Mm -hmm. And I think the Wild Harvest Initiative, the timing again is absolutely perfect for wild harvest because it's it fits within the matrix of that One Health approach. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that they didn't uh, prevail in asking half of the planet to not consume wild food. No, I'm telling you, they're, 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 these were clearly stated long, you know, scientific uh, papers and uh, white papers and so on delivered, you know, uh, saying that it's it, literally this, now, now it is, now is the time, you know. And of course, everybody was looking at Hospitals overflowing. Right. You know, it was it was a perfect time, in other words, to to to, right. to 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 foment that sentiment. But I think you know, and this is coming back to this ideas of how you can have sort of conflicting ideas both proceeding at the same time. There is again this growing idea, of course. No, a better way is to create systems where we can, in fact, be healthy together and recognize that people rely on the harvest of wild animals and that it's vitally important to their survival, to their ways of life, and to their cultures and spirituality, and those bloody things matter. Yeah, well, they matter to me. <laughs> and I think pretty much everyone watching or listening, yep. it's, uh, it matters a lot. So, well, I think this is a good place for us to maybe make a, a transition here to another topic. But before we do that, since we're cutting these into segments, and I can't say that for sure everyone's going to get every segment, I want to make sure you get a chance to tell the audience again where they can find out about the Wild Harvest Initiative. Well, they can find it out three ways. I guess one is by trying to track me down, which is not too <laughs> hard to do. You just put my name in there, you'll find me. And the second thing is to look for both Conservation Visions Dot com, uh, which is the organization that I have, which is does, does a lot of other things, but also runs the Wild Harvest Initiative, and also to just Google directly wildharvestinitiative.com, and you'll go to the website there, and you'll be able to gain experience from that. And of course, if you contact then Conservation Visions, there's a there's a lot of material. We have a lot of films now. We have a lot of popular articles. You know, we have a lot of things that we've put out there for public uh, right. distribution. And um, all of those, obviously, are freely available to, uh, mm -hmm. to whoever, whoever wants them and so on. So, but I appreciate you offering the chance for people. I mean, I do believe that this will prove to be, you know, lots of people know me for the model, but I think that this idea, frankly, is going to be probably more important in the long term um, in terms of helping us as a community of different citizens to come together about nature yeah. in a really meaningful way. And don't forget, again, that we're hoping that the, you know, the recovery, um, the RAWA, yeah. Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Act is going to 
you know, Pass. squeak through the the tunnels and turns of, of I politics. Hope. And uh, I hope so. If that happens, this will be an absolutely major achievement for the United States of America, just like the North American model was a major achievement, and and hopefully we will make. Uh, this wild harvest an achievement between our two countries as well. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. If anyone who follows uh, the world of Facebook, Conservation Visions has a very big presence there, and yep. we'll keep working on your Instagram and your YouTube. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, well, all the help we can get, Randy. Well, and, we'll and we'll take, take all the help. Yeah. We can get. <laughs> well, you have such amazing content, if you want to call it that. This. A library of accumulated information, data that you are putting together at the Wild Harvest Initiative. It is incumbent on people like me as a communicator and anyone else who is a communicator to take that information and put it out there with our audience because that is the next step of making it, it, a difference. There's no question. And that really is going to be the emphasis. We have a three phased approach in this. We're coming into the second phase now where the, we, we played around with releasing information, but we were cautious because we only had the first couple of right. years' data. Now we're going to start to turn into really releasing this information out there and asking the state agencies to do the same and on all of our partners to do the same and all of our friends and colleagues in the space to do the same as well. Yeah. Yep. Well, thanks for sharing all this, Shane. We Most welcome. We got it's been fun. More, we got lots more to cover. We do. We do. Looking forward to it. Ha, ha, ha.